I was in New York. I was getting uh, ready to go to work, uh, was shaving, and I heard on the radio, uh, which I listen to um, as I'm getting dressed for work normally, uh, that there was a report, it was put that way, a report that an airplane uh, may have hit the World Trade Center. That gets your attention. I didn't think at all anything about an airliner, much less a terrorist attack. I thought, well, first of all, maybe it didn't happen, but maybe I better go have a look. I live on the uh, east side, but live up high and have a small balcony. So I thought, well, I better go out the balcony. But while I was getting to the balcony and turned the radio up, and as my wife turned the radio up, then it was well, some kind of aircraft has probably hit it. But I envisioned a small aircraft. Uh, no thought of what the reality turned out to be. But as soon as I got out, um, I didn't even get fully out on the balcony. I could see uh, the smoke uh, from the first tower. and. You know, your news industry pops right then and say, whatever it is, however it is, smoke coming out of the World Trade Center, got to be a story. So, very hurriedly, um, I literally was buttoning my, my shirt going down the elevator and went over to the west side. It's not very far. And by the time I got there, it was very clear that we were dealing with a disaster of some kind. I still didn't know what the dimensions of it were. And you know, racing through my head, I, I need to get to the anchor chair. That was my job um, in these kinds of circumstances. But I did look up uh, 11th Avenue, uh, and already, you know, smoke was billowing. Some people were already fleeing in the far distance. And you know, part of my head was saying, "Boy, this looks bad. This looks really bad. What in the world could this be?" The other half was, uh, "Get to the chair." going through my own checklist like a pilot of what you do when you step into the anchor chair with uh, an unpredictable situation that's going to probably be a calamity. Such things of remember the first things you hear are frequently wrong. Uh, remind the audience whatever the dimensions of this, it's very important to stay steady. This is my own checklist of things. So I bolted inside the CBS News Broadcast Center and uh, immediately got into the anchor chair and we embarked on our um, days on end coverage. Well, first, at each network and with each anchor, uh, there are some things that are common and some things that each individual handles it his, his or her own way. Uh, at CBS News for many, many years, and by the time this happened, I'd been working there for, what, 40, probably well over 40 years. Uh, that the anchor desk is uh, is raised at CBS News. The anchor desk is actually in the newsroom. It's common in television these days to have a virtual newsroom seen behind you. It's not actually a newsroom, but at CBS News, I believe uh, now as then, but certainly then, it was a raised platform in the newsroom itself. Uh, and you go in, and I don't I mean it's the same thing, but it's a little like getting strapped into a high-performance aircraft. You get into the chair. Uh, my own way of working uh, live coverage, particularly if I thought it might be extended live coverage, uh, put in an earpiece in the left ear uh, where you're going to be hearing things from the control room. That's where they control what pictures go in the air, the control room. Uh, and in the right ear, uh, another earpiece, the two earpieces you put in very quickly. All this happens quickly and particularly under the circumstances of 9-11. Developing story at this point, uh, very early after the first plane hit, uh, nobody knew exactly what had happened. It was confusion. It would be impossible to overstate the confusion factor. But in our small world of the anchor desk at CBS News, we knew what we were doing in terms of how we were going to get in the air. So an earpiece in each ear. One goes so you have contact with the control room that controls the pictures. The other to the editorial side, which is going to tell you what kind of information we're getting. There's a dugout off to my left, um, John Reed, who'd done this. We'd been to this rodeo many, many times. Uh, I don't mean to make light of it, but it's almost by instinct. He was already there, and he has voice contact with me in one ear. 
The control room has voice contact with you in the other ear. He also has the capacity from down below in the dugout to hand you a note. Note might be, uh, don't forget to remind people uh, how little we know. In the control room, they may be saying to you in one ear, uh, we're going to go to pictures uh, from, I don't know, the Bowery. Uh, and in the other ear, it may be the person in editorial control. In this instance, the president of CBS News himself took the editorial control pretty quickly, might be saying um, that we still don't have very much information. We count on a just curious translation of that meaning, say what you've got to say, but we don't have a whole lot of real hard information for you to say. So you get strapped in and say all this happens pretty quickly. I literally raced in, uh, remembered to go to the men's room because you've had extended uh, on-air coverage. Uh, not that, that can get be a problem. Uh, made that quick stop, got buckled into the chair uh, with earpieces, checked with John Reed, my longtime compadre down on the left, and um, you start talking. I know it strikes a lot of people as strange, if not weird, uh, to be wearing two earpieces and to say, well, how do you do this? It's a skill, but it's not a very high-level skill. Uh, and it was my own way of working. I can't speak for others. I know a little bit about how uh, my competitors and friends of the networks work, but that's the way we had worked through election nights, through challenger explosions, hurricanes, earthquakes, everything. And you. You do compartmentalize. It's a little hard to explain. You may say, well, how, how can you do that? And again, it's not all that difficult if you've done it for a very long time. It, you can hear what the, the control room is saying in one ear, and sometimes somebody is talking to you simultaneously in the other ear. Not often, but sometimes. But you're trained, and let's face it, for a long time I had done this line of work. You, part of your brain absorbs what's coming in left ear, some of your brain absorbs coming in right ear, and at the same time you can kind of glance at something downstairs, and at the same time, most importantly, keep contact with the audience through the camera. Uh, so in, in the mechanical ways of the craft, that's what we're doing. In terms of coverage of what was happening, uh, that CBS News uh, was at least then a true worldwide news gathering operation. There's a difference between being a news gathering operation and being a news packaging operation. Some news organizations then, more now, were simply packages of news that other people gathered by and large. But CBS News was a worldwide news gathering organization as well as packagers. That, uh, and it's important to know that the ethos at CBS News, the the code, if you will, was that every person employed at CBS News was expected to be able to be a reporter. From the janitor to cafeteria workers through security guards, this was the ethos of the place. Now, if someone is saying, well, I don't believe that, well, that was the ethos. It's not to say that everybody did it, but the point is that with something like this, the atmosphere, the inside aura was everybody on deck, everybody ready to do whatever is necessary, and everybody keep their eyes and ears open, everybody willing, able to report. And the CBS News, we did what we call flood the zone. They say, every available person, get to the scene if you can. Uh, if you can't get to the scene, get as close to the scene as you can, and wherever you are, in Massachusetts, South Carolina, whatever, call in, touch base, be ready to help. Uh, in the early going, there was a, a, a dearth of uh, information, a lot of confusion. Well, was it a small plane? Was it a big plane? That's first off in the very early going. No, it was a big plane. Was it a military plane and a commercial plane? All these things are happening you know, fairly quickly. Um, by the time the second building was hit, a picture began to form. This is no accident. Uh, I would say it wasn't widely believed it was an accident once it was determined that an airliner hit it. But there was always some question, not always, for a while there was some question, well, could it have been a stray airliner? No, it wasn't a stray airliner. But 
but these things just cascade. Rumor, innuendo, information. Uh, sometimes you know as, oftentimes you know as a reporter, the person talking to you, a fireman, a policeman, perhaps even a fire or police commander, is trying to give you what he or she believes to be reliable information. But, you know, the code of the reporter's road is you trust your mother, but you cut the cards, which is a, a slang way of saying, um, even if it's someone in authority saying something, in particularly the early stages of this kind of calamity, uh, he or she may be giving you the best they know. They may be convinced themselves that what they're telling you is true, but it either isn't true or parts of it are not true. So, you know, the, the pace of coverage uh, escalated, accelerated uh, with a lot of speed. When I first got in the anchor chair, uh, not, not a whole lot was known. Within 10 or 15 minutes, a lot more was believed to be known. And each, seemingly every nanosecond, but certainly every few minutes, new information came in, effort to check it out. And as um, the anchor person uh, kept repeating to myself, remind the audience, tell them what we know, but just as important, maybe more important, is tell them what we don't know. You don't want to be so redundant about it that people get tired of hearing, but you need to remind them, you know, this is what you say to them. Folks, this is an unprecedented situation, the full dimensions of which we do not yet know. What we're going to try to do here as the minutes and hours go by is we're going to try to establish facts as best we can. Facts are very hard to establish in these circumstances, but we will tell you what we know and we'll tell you what we don't know. We'll try to make that clear as you go through the coverage. Well, certainly you feel a responsibility uh, to be, first of all, an honest broker of information, a reliable relayer of information. And I was taught to think of it of, and did think of it of, that is your role as being uh, sort of presiding over the national hearth certainly from the time of the Kennedy assassination forward, the television in some of the country's most critical moments um, serves that function. National hearth, I always thought of it. This is the way one should think of oneself in, in the anchor chair. You want to be an honest broker of information, you want to be just more reliable insofar as you can be, and understand that it's not about you. As you know, television is, uh, particularly being on camera, is an extremely egocentric uh, experience. And even on an ordinary day, one has to remind oneself, it's not about me. But in this kind of situation, no problem. It's not about me. It's not really about CBS News. This is about the country. This is about something bigger than all of us. And that was very apparent not from the snap get-go, but fairly early on, uh, that this is, uh, this is about the country. And that, I, you know, I've, I've felt that way before, but that day, uh, I, I do remember, I didn't have time to think about much else other than the story, because with a journalist, the story is, is everything. But I, I do specifically remember when I stepped up to that elevated place where the anchor chair was, uh, of saying to myself, um, not in, it, at least for once in my life, not in any self-serving, egocentric way, uh, whatever the situation is, it looks really bad. But I've done this kind of work for a very long time. In some ways, without even intending to, I've, uh, I'm prepared. I've, I've prepared myself uh, for a lot of my professional life to do just this kind of thing. So step up and deliver. Uh, and the other was uh, that in a time such as this, people are depending on you. I don't, again, the metaphor may not stand up, but uh, I'm tempted to say most men, many men, when you walk out of the house, 
in the morning and that screen door hits your backside, you are saying to yourself, you know, I have three other people depending on me, wife and two kids, or four other people depending on me. It's that sense of, okay, I gotta stand tall here, I gotta go to work, I gotta make a living, they're depending on me. And that's, that's a tiny part of the big feeling when you step into the anchor chair on something like this, of saying people are depending on you, and they're depending, you know, the news organization is depending on you, that's important, yes. Um, but more importantly, the people tuning in are really depending on you. And so you strive to be at or near your best. Uh, it's not always possible to do so, but in a very personal way that was happening. And, but more than any other time in, in my experience, it just permeated me the whole time of the sense of responsibility of what you're doing. And Edward R. Murrow, who is the, not just the, a saint of electronic journalism, but the founding saint of electronic journalism, of whom I and almost everybody else at CBS News is a good student, one of his favorite words was steady. During the, his um, legendary broadcast from Great Britain during World War II, he pointed out that one of the favorite words of the British under great strain was steady, steady. And uh, that went through my mind at the time. It, so there is a sense of responsibility. There's this sense of, okay, it's a crisis. Once it was explicitly and undeniably true, it was not only a crisis, uh, but a calamity, a catastrophe. It was, well, people are gathering around the national hearth, which is the television set. Uh, we Americans pride ourselves on when, when the pressure's on. Um, we try to be our best, individually and uh, collectively. And, and we try to have that sense of responsibility um, all through the broadcast time. But I want to pause and say that it, we're talking about a specific piece, really, I won't say a tiny piece, but a small piece of the whole picture, that, you know, we knew, everybody was aware, uh, from a fairly early time, that a lot of people were dead. I can't say, because it isn't true, that we thought there'd be thousands dead in the early going, and many others, thousands wounded in some way. But anybody who's an experienced reporter has covered the police beat, has covered firehouses and, and fires, and knows what they do. and there was a, a strong sense of, boy, this is, this is some kind of hell for firemen and some kind of hell for policemen. Uh, I can remember talking very quickly doing well, some other correspondence on the air from some place on, of, um, have you heard anything about casualties in the fire department? And in the early going, well, the answer was, was no. Uh, well, later we know uh, that the fire department and the police department uh, paid it an exceptionally heavy price. But my point here is that there's so many things going on while you're on the air, while you're trying to keep yourself steady, while you're trying to help the audience be steady, have a sense of the national heart, have a sense of your responsibility in one thing or another, that, you know, going through, I can say from a very early stage, concerned about the firemen and policemen who had to deal head on with this, the people in the building. And then there were uh, you know, hundreds of personal stories. The director who was uh, hurried into the control room to direct the picture coverage and the broadcast coverage, uh, he had some reason to believe that one mem member of his family might have been down there. Can you imagine what it was for him? He's, he's, he's on the, the biggest story he could imagine in, in his life with tremendous responsibility, trying to direct all that at the same time trying desperately to get some word of whether this member of his family was safe or not. Uh, so, all, you know, all of that was going on. It, at, at first, at the very, in the very early stages, there wasn't any thought about how long we'd be on the air. But there was, uh, everybody knew we'd be on the air for a long time. As the information such as we had it escalated, 
it was pretty clear from the beginning that we'd be on the air for the rest of the day, probably all night, and days on end after that, which of course turned out to be the case. I can't speak for the other networks, but I know it, uh, with CBS News and with CBS, uh, canceling all programming was uh, immediate. In the very early going, was obviously we're going to go wall to wall, as the phrase goes in our business, with wall to wall coverage uh, for as long as it takes. And by not very deep into the mid to late morning, um, the decision, there was no doubt about it. It was stay on the air as long as we have to, and we're probably going to have to stay on the air for a long time. Um, it, it didn't matter. This was um, a, a big decision money-wise, because the network makes the money off advertising. But it, it was it, it immediate uh, and without doubt. There really was any doubt about it. I don't know what the conversation was. I think it probably was somebody at BlackRock, the corporate headquarters is separate from the news network, uh, news headquarters, the corporate headquarters separate from the news headquarters, different parts of town. But the decision that we would cover uh, for as long as it took and all regular program would be blown out uh, was immediate and final. WCBS, which is an owned and operated local station in New York, owned and operated by CBS News, had a tower um, that went down. They were off the air for a while. I wasn't aware of that at the time. Nobody said anything to me at the time, nor should they have had. I've forgotten how long they were off the air, but they were off the air for a while. But even their tower is kind of deep in the television business, but the tower was for those people who did not have cable or satellite provider what we call old-fashioned, original-style TV. So sets were, were black on the WCBS station in the New York area, but if you had cable or satellite, uh, it wasn't affected. That I had appeared on the Letterman program any number of times before, uh, knew David some, that you know, we, we had, as others had, as the nation had, it was an incredible week. Uh, and like so many other people, including our heroes, uh, firemen, policemen, first responders of all kind, we had worked pretty much around the clock all week with uh, a laser beam kind of focus on doing as good a job as we could do and a sense of heavy responsibility to it. So somebody, I think on that Monday, uh, it's after a week, whatever day of the week it was, uh, Someone called me from the front office of CBS News and said the Letterman program um, is going to go back on the air. All program had been all program had been wiped out for a very long time, but decision made Letterman is going to come back on the air along with other uh, some other network programming, and that uh, he would like for you to you know come over. And I said, of course, uh, that any time David asked, I always go over. I didn't think much about it, and I should have. It was a mistake of mine not, you know, we were still gathering a lot of news and on the air a lot, and it was just, Letterman wants you to come over, sure, I'll come over. But I, the reason I should have thought about it is that when you're that intensely focused on your job, as anybody who had a job, and, and mine in many ways was, I won't say the least of them, but it doesn't compare to what firemen, policemen, and first responders were doing. And I want to make explicitly clear, I never felt that way, I don't now. But in, in our compact world, the broadcast headquarters, we had this you know, really sharp focus on doing the best job we could do. I hadn't made the transition with my own personal emotions. As a pro, you were trained when something with tremendous emotional impact hits, um, some hammer to the heart, your own personal heart, uh, that of your neighbors, that of your city, that of the nation, that the kinds of emotions that most people go through when they turn on the television set and hear it, enough to make you uh, injustifiably weep in grief, for example. For the pro, who's a journalist, and for other professionals, other craft, you have to seal that out. And 
I remember in the Kennedy assassination, when we first determined the president was, was dead, even before it was announced, we determined he was dead. It was just, it was literally like a big sledgehammer, boom. And you feel yourself beginning to come apart. But as a younger reporter then, that, that's not what Pro does. Okay, get a grip here. Go on. And so it was with 9 11. So my point is that the kind of emotional impact that it had in a very personal way on most people all during that week, with so much to do and trying to keep your focus, I hadn't gone through that. So when I say it was a mistake, it wasn't a mistake to say I would go on Letterman, uh, but uh, I should have taken myself aside, maybe for an hour or a couple of hours, just to kind of gather myself. Instead, I kept working and worked right up to the time the Letterman program is uh, taped during the afternoon, generally speaking. But I, you know, I just kept working and said, well, okay, I have to go to the Letterman show at certain, certain time. And so when the time came, I sort of rushed over and got in the studio. And that was the setup to that situation, if you will. Now, uh, I, had, I had no idea what Dave had in mind. And anybody who knows David Letterman knows that part of the way he works is he doesn't tell anybody in advance what he's going to ask or what he's going to go through. Uh, he thinks that makes for a better program, and so do I, by the way. Point is, we had, I don't remember any discussion with him other than saying hello as I walked on the set. And that among the things that a professional journalist is trained to do is uh, not show your emotions um, on the air. That's, that's the ultimate goal. But I'm not a robot. Nobody I know in journalism, journalism is a robot. So like a lot of things in life, that's the ultimate goal. Never let your emotions show on the air. But sometimes uh, they're going to show. Walter Cronkite with the death of John F. Kennedy. Uh, other emotions show through. And I think the public understands that. I think the audience understands that very well. And that it was, for me, it, and this is the point, it was the first time I was able to sort of take a deep breath and internalize, if you will, personally, what had happened. See those firemen? <laughs> Take his permit, will you? Okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, well, uh, I can finish. No, 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 Dan, take care of yourself. We'll, we'll be right back here with Dan, rather. And I know there have been people, um, not just journalists, but some of the people who criticize that, saying, well, you know, you, uh, you, you should let your emotions show. I have no apology for it. I, had, I didn't have any then, and I don't uh, have any now. There's no apologizing for grief. And this was really the first time that I was able to internalize the enormity of what had happened and the grief over what had happened. And because I was spending my life almost literally every hour on camera in some way during that whole week, um, that it played out on, on camera. But I have found since then, I was, when I came off the program, I can't say I was worried about it, I was concerned about it, saying, gosh, I just, I didn't plan to, to do that. Uh, but when you started talking about it, it just kind of let out. I said to myself, well, so I'm not sure how people are going to react to that. But then very quickly said to myself, frankly, I don't give a damn how they react to it. Um, that, that's how I felt. Uh, but I found overwhelmingly most people very understanding about it. Now, the other thing that came out of that interview was, at some point, this may not be a precisely accurate quote, that it was a version of, you know, it's, it's time for us to stand, you know, united, that we all understand that we're under attack, and, uh, you know, printed on uh, some, some money, and we all just united we stand. And so I said some words that, in fact, time, you know, and, and that, I added, applies to all of us. Uh, and 
you know, whatever you think or don't think about this president, what have you, he's the commander in chief under attack. And uh, my phrase was, uh, and uh, if he needs me, just tell me where to line up. Now, that grew out of when I was a child when Pearl Harbor was attacked in World War II. And I was, what, uh, 10 years old. Every member, every male member of uh, our family and every male in the neighborhood, including a gentleman who lived down the street who only had one leg, uh, instantly started out to go downtown to a recruiting station. They didn't even talk to one of these women. Almost nobody had a car. It was in the back edge of the Depression. So it, it just, it was all kind of a mass movement out of the neighborhood to go down to the local shuttle bus, which was the main bus. Uh, it was in that spirit of a, you know, sure, I was barely aged, you know, if, if you need somebody to go to the Marines, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Uh, it, it was in that spirit of tell me where to line up. Again, I found the public as a whole understood that and took it in that spirit. There's always going to be somebody who says, well, he shouldn't have done that. He should, after all, with George Bush, he tells George Bush he's going to line up. Well, then and now, uh, my attitude toward that is, you bet, with the country under attack, uh, our president is not only head of government, but head of state. Uh, and if this or any other president needs me, under these circumstances, he's got me. I think the public, uh, I know the public at large understood that as it came over the air in a sense. But I've uh, gotten some criticism about it, that and the, the uh, crying. Uh, but you know, that goes with the territory. Okay. What I do remember is that David was very understanding uh, and very supportive. He said, for God's sakes, you're human. You're a human being. You know, I, I know I've seen it print since then. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and, and so it was. I, you know, I think far too much, uh, insofar as anything's been made, I think far too much. And Dave understood right away, uh, and without exception, uh, my peers and others at CBS News understood it right away. You know, I think this is important to understand and to at least muse about a little, be thoughtful about, that a, an institution, an iconic figure, such as David Letterman coming back on the air, the, the Yankees and the Mets resuming play, difficult, delicate decision, like when is the right time to do that? Nobody can do it with perfection. It, it's a matter of fingertip and gut feel when to come back on that we'd gone through a period, we'd absorbed these blows, tremendous blows. Um, we needed to pull ourselves together second stage, well, the stages. David Letterman would not have gone on the air two nights after this, even if the network had asked him and they didn't, no thought was given to it, but even if they had, they wouldn't have gone on. Uh, but the, sort of feeling the time, you know, it, to those who made the decision, I was not involved in the decision, that a David Letterman needs to come back on the air. I have every reason to believe, and I think it's true, that there was some consultation with uh, people in government and elected representatives. What do you think? But we needed to, as I say, move to the second stage, and then third stage, fourth stage, come out of it. Not unlike and I want to be very sensitive in making this comparison. If your mother passes away, or your father, or your brother, you're going to grieve. And for each individual person, the time of bereavement, it, you can't judge it. But as an individual, you know. Most of the time, you know. It may be hours, it may be days, it may be a week. Say to yourself, listen, this is, and it's this way with 
but on an individual basis, you say, you know, someone very dear to you passes. This hurt <coughs> is never going to go. This hurt is never going to go away. You see, so it will always be with me. I'll never forget it. But uh, it's time to to move on. It's like a hurt knee that it may be all right days on the end, but any time it rains, it begins to hurt. I'm a lifelong baseball fan. Of course I remember the Yankees coming back and the Mets coming back. And didn't they handle it very well? Both teams handled it very well. And for those who are, are not New Yorkers, um, naive or otherwise, it may be a little difficult to understand how important baseball is to so many people in this city. But all of this was part of, okay, let's get past the immediate grieving stage. Let's pull together. We got a lot of work to do, and we got a lot of, a lot of fighting to do. So let's get things back as near to normal as they can be and get on with that work. You know, it's been said of Americans, and I believe it to be true, I know it to be true, that Americans are uh, hard to herd and impossible to stampede. We, we have a lot of faults, you know, as a nation, as a society, as a people. Um, but we believe in of ourselves, and a lot of people around the world believe. So we go through this grieving period. At the same time, we've got to, we've got to pull out our dead from the debris bury the dead, honor the dead, take care of the wounded, both psychologically and physically, uh, mount our, our fighting abilities, our defense abilities, begin to rebuild all of these things. But, you know, this is a tremendously diverse country, ours, over 300 million people, and a, a new thing in history still an experimental thing in history. Can a multiracial, multireligious, multi-ethnic uh, conglomeration of people hold themselves together, stay united? Now, when the country started, most of the world said, impossible. Nobody's ever been able to do it. In their but we're still working this experiment. And I think I thought at the time, and I think even more so now, they spoke uh, yards about the country, that when we needed it the most, uh, didn't stampede. Really, whatever color, race, religion, pulled together. And in some ways, and it may seem odd to say it, it was a devastating time in terms of grieving. It was also a kind of magical time in pulling the country together. Uh, I've never seen New York before or since, so as one. And I would, it's not original with me, but I would suggest that the country as a whole, the whole nation, has never been as much as one since World War II. And it was in the first days and weeks after 9-11. Part of that has to do with the fact that it is a thing that we had not had uh, an attack on the soil of the continental United States um, since the uh, 19th century. Uh, and that Lincoln, with his usual eloquence, said once in speaking of aftermath well, during the Great Civil War, that we were fighting ourselves in the Civil War, and we had great carnage during that time. But Lincoln said, it's almost impossible for us to imagine a, a foreign invasion force drinking from the Ohio or leaving footprints in the Appalachians. And we all grew up with that, our fathers grew up with that, and our father's father grew up with that, that 
uh, and to have this on our own soil of 3,000 people uh, to be killed in a very short time, so many more wounded, you know, that it was, it wasn't like a foreign invasion force drinking from the Ohio or leaving footprints in the Appalachians, but it was as close as we've had to that uh, any time in the last 150 or so years. Not, not since Pearl Harbor. So sure. in my lifetime, uh, Pearl Harbor, the Kennedy assassination, and 9-11, and as much as either of the other two in its own way, but those are the benchmarks for the time when the country was hit with something spectacularly, lethally devastating by surprise and was put to the test. Everybody right. in the stands, it's, it's almost like one of those pictures, you see pictures of Yankee Stadium, Shea Stadium and City Field didn't exist at the Yankee Stadium. In the, the 30s, even later as the 40s, you see a still picture. Everybody, every man has on a hat. As far as you can see, they're hats. Um, with the first game after 9-11, you look at the still picture, and you're right, emotionally, psychologically, people are sitting sort of like this. It's easy to extrapolate, you know, big thoughts out of baseball. It is, after all, a game. But exactly right. Nobody quite knew how to think, how to behave. What do we do? We're in the stadium. We're eager to get back to baseball, we're eager to get, you know, get on with life. We know what we have to do, and we'll do it, but we need to get on with life. But how does one behave under these circumstances? What do we do? And then fortunately, in, in the first game, uh, there's nothing quite like a home run ball to bring people in a baseball stadium uh, to their feet. And I think it, it was with that home run ball. Yay. And we're getting back to as close to normal as we're going to get back to for a very long time. I remember that some were done. Uh, it's not an excuse, but I was doing my own work. But uh, I, I, it, 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 what it was, but it wasn't just concert in Madison Square Garden, concert at Carnegie Hall, uh, through the deep, rich culture of of New York City, and I know it was to a certain degree in some other places, there was an effort made to continue to keep going this sense of we're in this together, along with, but we're not going to be all tight and feel constricted by it. And culture sometimes gets a bad word. Uh, it gets a bad name, you know, people say, oh, culture is only for the effete and the elite. But here, it, it was, you know, baseball is a very important part of our culture. Baseball came back, when the, whether it's a rock concert or um, a symphonic music concert, uh, whether it's a prayer group or a breakfast coffee group. I think there was a sense running through certainly through New York and I think through the country. Okay, we got a lot of fighting to do, we've got a lot of work to do, we've got a lot of rebuilding to do, but we aren't going to just walk around all the heads hanging, shoulders sloping. Um, that uh, we, we've taken a really heavy lick, but we're not down and we're certainly not defeated. And, so far as I know, there was no coordination of, well, okay, let's bring baseball back, let's bring the concerts back, let's have something in Madison Square Garden, let's have something in Carnegie Hall. If there was any coordination of this, I'm not aware of it. Uh, I think probably for some phone calls were made, as I mentioned, in the case of the Letterman program, maybe a phone call, maybe a phone call was made somewhere saying, listen, we're thinking about coming back on the air, what do you think? But I think a lot of this was, was spontaneous.
that each individual, I mean, rock group said to themselves, what can we do? What, what should we do? What can we do? Baseball said, what can we do? What should we do? Um, Musicians, Broad, artists. Broadway, is, I mean, Broadway had some of the same decision. We talked, excuse me one second. Um, we talked about the decision when to bring television programs back on the air, such as the Letterman program. But Broadway had its version of this. When do the bright lights of Broadway come back on? We even want, they're off, we went dark, went away. When do you bring them back on? There were a lot of individual and organizational decisions made. But, and I smile when I say this as a reminder, in a free society, it's not somebody in Washington saying, okay, get back to, with Broadway, get back with the baseball games, get back with the concerts. And in our United States of America, our beloved United States of America, a constitutional republic based on the principles of freedom and democracy, that's not the way we do it. Anyone who has even a passing knowledge of history knows that the test of, of societies, the test of nations is do they, and if so, how well do they hold themselves together under immense pressure and tension that with the Kennedy assassination, there never was any question the vice president was going to become the president of the country. Through history and even up to very recent times, in a lot of countries, in a lot of societies, when the leader goes down, whether assassination or what have you, there are rings around the White House, around the palace, and you have a attempted coup, you have a breakout of a civil war, whatever. So when, when President Kennedy was assassinated, tremendous emotional shock to the whole country, but it spoke so well, particularly about a country versus ours, the transfer of power went off without a hitch, without question. And with 9-11, immense pressure on the nation, on the society. A president who was elected in one of the closest elections in the history of the country, a lot of controversy. Keep in mind, this was long after the 2000 election that this happened. But again, I think it's, it, it spoke so well of the country as a whole that there wasn't any doubt. We've been attacked. One of the roles of the President of the United States is Commander-in-Chief. And whatever else anybody, I or anybody else might have thought of him before that moment, uh, it was, okay, we look to him for leadership, not just him, look to him for leadership. History will judge how well or how poorly he handled that. The point is that, once again, under sudden surprise, devastating emotional and otherwise event, that the country came together. Wasn't any talk of uh, civil war, coup, quite the opposite. It was, we understand, we get it, that What's essential is that we pull together, that we stand united. We'll have our arguments later, but that we pull together and stand united. And at a time, now as we speak in 2011, that a lot of talk about, you know, what's the future of the United States economically, militarily, what happens to us, um, how good are we, and however good we are, how good can we be going forward I think there's some lessons to be learned from 9-11 and in the more distant past, the Kennedy assassination and Pearl Harbor.